Hey guys, thank you for joining our webinar. We're going to give everyone maybe a minute or two to get connected. We've got about half of the people online, so hang tight. We'll be getting started in about a minute or two. Hey guys, I see everyone connecting. A few people are still getting their audio on, so we're going to give it one more minute and then we're going to get cranking. All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, Amy, Amanda, are you guys able to see my PowerPoint screen? I just want to make sure it's good before we get jumping in. Yeah, we can see it. It looks great. Okay, awesome. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And, um, awesome. Go ahead and get things going. All right. Well, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. This is Amy at LawPay, and we are so excited to bring you um, this presentation today about five most common trust accounting pitfalls. And we are even more excited to be working with TrustBooks on this. They are one of our newest partners and we have to say that working with them has been such a delight and the partnership between LawPay and TrustBooks just makes so much sense. These guys really, really understand trust accounting. They really understand lawyers' most basic needs and their whole goal is just to make this process as simple as possible to remove any dangers for, for attorneys and they've made software that's so simple, so easy to use just to keep attorneys compliant. So we love working with them and can't say enough great things about them. They are the perfect, perfect people to deliver this message to you today. So um, yeah, we are really, really excited to get going and to hear um, what Tom has for us. So thank you again for, for spending a little bit of your lunch hour with us and we're really excited about this. So Chad, I'm gonna pass it back to you um, and, and let's kick this off. Great, thank you very much. Um, we so uh, are so excited ourselves um, to be meeting with you guys. We've, we've been working with uh, LawPay for uh, maybe about a year now or so. Great, great company uh, to work with. They really care about their customers and doing trust accounting the right way, which is very important to us. I'm, I'm going to take just two minutes and tell you a little bit about who we are and why we exist and then kind of what we're going to work on today. And then I'm going to pass it over to my partner, Tom, who's the CPA and the accountant in the group, and he's actually going to run with it from there. But our, our story is one of um, trying to fit a need in not having a product to do it. So Tom, before we started TrustBooks, um, managed his own CPA firm where he did outsourced accounting for attorneys. And the pain he was having is there wasn't a good way to help people manage that process. We had to use tools like Excel and QuickBooks, which weren't really meant for trust accounting. And in doing so, it, it gave a lot of room for error. So he really set upon this journey of finding the perfect software to help him manage his clients better, and he couldn't find it. So he got with me, and we worked together to create it. And that's really what our focus is now, is every week we push ourselves to find out, can we make trust accounting easier? Can we help people be more compliant? Can we take away the fear from trust accounting? And in doing so, it's kind of positioned us as the thought leaders in that space We've helped tons of customers 
um, go, uh, that have been audited, get things back on track. We've, we've helped them identify the pitfalls, uh, the things to look for. And Tom's really going to share today some of the best practices that we've gotten over the last two years of working in the trenches with our customers and our attorneys and helping them figure out how to get their trust accounting back on track. So, um, Tom, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Are you in? I'm in. Okay, great. I'm going to make you the presenter. And we're going to have a changing of the guard. Perfect. So everybody can see uh, see my screen here. So we've got um, that handsome guy without the glasses. That's me. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I, I'll admit something real quick before I jump in. Um, <laughs> I, I had to go reboot my computer. So um, I'm kind of coming into this in just a, a little bit of a frenzy, um, hoping that my, my old reliable computer would, would get up and running, and it did. So... Uh, she hasn't let me down yet. So I'm going to jump in. As Chad mentioned, uh, he's the one on the left. I'm the, um, I'm the accountant-looking guy on the right. So I've got my, my typical accountant-issued uniform that's uh, blue button-down, khakis, uh, glasses. Um, if you look real closely, maybe you can see a, a calculator in back pocket. Here we are. Uh, just wanted to show us. This is us exhibiting at Clio Conference. So we just got back from that. We had a great time. Chad and I, man in the booth, holding it down. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and, um, and, and kind of why I'm here giving this presentation, my background, and, and why that kind of puts me in this position to talk to everybody on the phone. So I'm a uh, co-founder of TrustBooks, and I know Chad mentioned it, but we're the leaders in trust accounting software. My background, I'm a CPA. So my, uh, my first kind of Outside of getting a master's in accounting, I went into that big world CPA firm. Uh, I was with McGladry and Pullen. I was with Deloitte and Touche. And I did kind of all that natural stuff that you do in, in big CPA firm world. Uh, I was on the audit side. I went out of uh, being at Deloitte in about 2010. And in 2010, I started my own CPA practice. And with that CPA practice, uh, I focused almost exclusively uh, working with small law firms. And so day one of working with small law firms, I knew that it really had to be up to me to, to know these trust rules inside and out. If I was going to go talk to attorneys and say, hey, I want to earn your business, uh, their first question was, well, great, do you know trust rules? Because that's um, a very scary topic. It's the accounting topic, and you need to know it inside and out. And so put it, uh, took it upon myself to know those rules really well. Fast forward to today. And I've kind of got this maybe self-proclaimed trust accounting expert, but I've um, given about 30 different webinar and CLE presentations uh, spanning probably 3,000 plus attorneys and legal support staff over the past couple of years. Um, so I've really kind of honed in on this niche of knowing the rules, being able to relate it to the legal profession, understanding these pain points that you're going through. And these pain points, a lot of them are the same pain points that I experienced running Boyle CPA. Uh, it was the catalyst for starting trust books. I was looking for um, something that could help me solve the trust accounting problem and, and complexity, and I couldn't found, find one. So that was the start of trust books and teaming up with Chad to uh, go out there and, and start trust books. Uh, and then kind of lastly, I've got, I'm Steph Curry's number one fan. I love Steph Curry. We had a little rough go at it last night. So any of uh, you Houston folks on the call today, uh, y'all got the better of us. I'm a Davidson grad, so I've been following Steph Curry for a long time. Um, big fan. So this is our webinar today. I'm going to just jump in, and let's talk about uh, the agenda. So we're going to go through three things. I'm sorry to interrupt. One thing I want to mention before we start, if anybody has a question, you're currently muted, but you'll have a go to my webinar um, banner section that's got like audio, dashboard. Um, in there is a section called chat and a section called questions. If you just want to type your questions right into there, I'll be fielding those as we go, and we'll answer some along the way, and then I will queue them all up for Q&A at the end. So um, feel free to keep the questions coming. The more interactive, the better. All right. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, no, perfect, perfect. Um, 
and, and like Chad said, yeah, we encourage questions. We, we like to back and forth. We want this to be more informal uh, so you get the most out of it. But um, so today's webinar, we're going to try to keep this to about 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to go over a few things. Why this webinar? So I'm really going to dive into the, the understanding of why we need a webinar on the trust accounting pitfalls. Um, you know, what are the stats showing us? And just, you know, a little bit of a spoiler alert, attorneys don't do a great job of managing their trust account. Uh, it's, it's this crazy uh, concept that you went to law school and it's weird. They didn't teach you in accounting. Um, so we're going to help you kind of overcome that. We're going to talk about the five common pitfalls. And then I'm a big fan of taking these pitfalls and not just talking about them, but actually showing you some real world examples. So I want to take the pitfalls. I want to show you how does it look. Um, I'm going to use TrustBooks. Uh, as a way to show you how to overcome these pitfalls, uh, but it'd be the same if you're using QuickBooks or Excel, using some sort of software to help you overcome these pitfalls. And then I'm going to end with just next steps. What can you take from today's webinar so you can take action items today to improve and overcome uh, these pitfalls? So why this webinar? Real simple question. Do you know the number one way to get this barred. If you guessed the mismanagement of the trust account, bingo, you are correct. I'm going to guess anybody have that reaction? Maybe more of a Kramer fan. Maybe you've got this reaction. So I know uh, trust accounting, number one way to get this barred. Uh, I teach this stuff all the time. It is shocking. And so on that note, I'm going to sprinkle in some stats throughout today's webinar. So I want to highlight um, everything that we talk about with stats. And so to understand where I'm pulling these stats from, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so in North Carolina, and the reason why I'm going to use North Carolina for some of these stats is because North Carolina as a state is one of the, the few that do a random audit program. And it allows us to get a lot of good insight into what is happening in the trust accounting world, in the legal profession. So North Carolina, every quarter, the state bar goes out, they audit about 60 trust accounts. And from those 60 trust accounts, they pull together and say, say all right, you know, where are, the, uh, where are they in compliance? Where are they out of compliance? And Ann, Ann's the field auditor in North Carolina, she reports this to the ethics committee and it gets documented. And so we're able to really pull some good information from these letters. Uh, a little, little background, Anne, um, the predecessor to Anne was a gentleman named Bruno Damali. Talk about a, a scary scenario. Uh, anybody in North Carolina, that, that name Bruno Damali lives in infamy um, as the field auditor that would come out and audit your trust accounts. So I've got up here on the screen 74%. So I talked about number one way to get disbarred is mismanage of the trust account. Let's back it up with some stats. 74% of all disbarments in North Carolina during 2015 were related to mismanagement of the trust account. 74%, big number. That improved slightly in 2016. It was only 50%. So one out of two disbarments were related to mismanagement of the trust account. And so that's why this is an important topic. And that's why we're here today to help you kind of overcome where some common areas that could lead to potential disbarment. So let's jump in and understand the five pitfalls. So the first one we're going to go over is this concept of maintaining client ledgers. And so in its simplest form, every deposit, every payment has to be assigned to a client. And so what I mean by it has to be assigned, every transaction, literally every transaction that comes in to the trust account has to go with a client. And this is important because it feeds into a couple of other uh, pitfalls and other rules and regulations. It feeds into uh, never bring a client into the negative. So at no point can you bring a client ledger into the negative. Well, how do you know if you brought a client ledger into the negative unless you're actually maintaining client ledgers? It also feeds into this concept of the three-way reconciliation. And both of those We'll get into a little later in, in a few uh, slides. So here's what a ledger looks like. 
So I've got a ledger. Um, I've got all my transactions for this specific client. You can see the ins and outs, ins and outs for everything for this specific client. And at any given time, I can see what my ledger balance is for this client. So in this example, I, big surprise here, I got Steph Curry as my client. You can see that at the end of the day, um, Steph Curry's got $2,275 in the trust account. So I'm going to pull open, and bear with me a second, I'm going to pull open Trustbooks just to highlight this of how it looks in the real world. So I apologize again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming in a little late um, trying to get everything going, but I'm going to log into one of our accounts. And while I'm doing that, let's see here. So I'm almost in. Here we go. All right. So real quick, I'm going to show you the client ledgers. Before I do that, here's what we're trying to get at. So I've got trust books pulled up. I've got a dashboard page here. Here's my trust account. So this dollar amount has to be segregated on a client by client basis. That's what we're trying to get to. That's what this concept of maintaining client ledgers is. And so as I give you an example here, just to show you what we're looking at, here's trust account, my balance. This is high level. This is going to match your bank statement. This is going to match the available funds in your bank account. And so why this is important is typically, especially the smaller law firms, they have one trust account. Maybe you've got two, maybe you've got three, but typically you've got one trust account. And in that one trust account, you put all of your client transactions, all the funds being deposited, all the disbursements going out, all flow through that one trust account. So you've got one bank account. And so within this, I've got this one bank account, $189,000. I've got to be able to tell you how every single transaction shows up on a client ledger. And so within TrustBooks, um, I, if I scroll down under matters, I've got the ability to look at my view matter list. And you can see, here's that breakout. So here are all my ledgers, and I'll show you what this looks like. So I've got all my clients. I can tell you this 189,000, how that is comprised on a client by client basis. So I've got Ron Burgundy. So Ron has some contract negotiation I'm representing. And you see, here's the deposit coming in. Here are the checks going out. Now, this all feeds into that 189,000, but I can see it broken out for this specific client. That's my client ledger. Okay, so now I'm gonna scroll down. Um, we're gonna get into the second pitfall. And I'll start this second pitfall with a, another stat. So we talked about maintaining client ledgers, and that's gonna feed into never bringing client ledger into the negative. Never. And so here we've got an example, 23%. So in quarter two, 2017, this is really recent, 23% of the 60-ish trust accounts audited failed uh, this requirement. 23% brought client ledgers into the negative. To me, that's a big number. That's, this is one of the really core uh, aspects and principles of maintaining a, a good trust account and keeping compliance with your state bar. And that's shocking that 23% failed on this one. And just to give you a little bit more background on some of these numbers, North Carolina in terms of compliance should be one of these states that is even more compliant than another state because you have to take a one hour CLE course. And so you have to take a one hour CLE course on trust accounting. So they should be very knowledgeable and have the education and they're still failing this at a pretty alarming rate. So negative client balances, never. And you know, th this isn't one of those ones where you have to overthink it. If you've got a client balance, so in this example, Ron Burgundy, he's got $5,500. If I was to try and cut a check make a disbursement for anything greater than $5,500 on behalf of Mr. Burgundy, I would be bringing this client into the negative, and that's a big no-no. And here's why. I'm always a big fan of the why. So if I were to say cut a check for $6,000 on behalf of Ron Burgundy, essentially I would be taking $500 from a different client 
and using it on behalf of Ron Burgundy. And so just put yourself in that in those shoes. Put yourself in that scenario. If somebody else is holding your money and they're pulling it together with other people's money, and then somebody else that they've pulled it together for, they cut a check for greater than the dollar amount that they've given them to hold, then they could be taking money from you that they're holding and using it for that other person. You wouldn't be too happy about that. And that's what we're getting at here. So hopefully, you know, um, you've got software in place. This is the challenge, and this is just one thing and why this pitfall exists and happens. In the real world, if you're using Excel, if you're using QuickBooks, just know that there's no preventative control here. You can cut a check for as much as you want, and there's nothing that's going to prevent you from doing that. And I'll, I'll mention in TrustBooks, we actually stop you from being able to do this. So if you're using TrustBooks, you can't bring it into the negative. But the reason why 23% bring this client ledger into the negative, because they can go in, they're using you know handwriting checks, they're using Excel, they're using QuickBooks. You write a check for as much as you want, and there's nothing stopping you from uh, cutting that check. There's no uh, red flag. There's no stop. There's no preventative control there. And I've seen that. That's that's what's going on there. All right. So we've gotten through two of the pitfalls. We're going to spend some time here on the three-way reconciliation. This is a big one. This is very important. And as through my 30 or so presentations on CLEs and on webinars, this is the one that I focus on the most because it's the one that attorneys and, and law firms probably have the most insight or the least insight um, and, the, and the least grasp and comfort around. And so real quick, before I get into the stat, here are the three parts. So what we're doing here is we're reconciling our bank statement to our trust ledger to the sum of our client balances. So let me repeat that. We are the three parts to this three-way reconciliation. Bank statement, trust ledger, and the sum of my client balances. And I'll show you why this is important, but right here is our stat. This is where 47%, so in Q2 2015, 47% of those audited uh, failed this. So a big number, one out of two. And in, you know, in 2017, this number went down to 33%, so some improvement. So it went from one out of two to one out of three. That's good. That's improvement. But that's still a really high number for uh, a requirement to be um, with your state bar. Now, I'll take this a step further. There was an alarming number of people that just didn't do any sort of reconciliation. So the reconciliation, the basic reconciliation, of reconciling your bank statement to your trust ledger. In 2015, 26% didn't do any sort of reconciliation. So almost one out of four. In 2017, that number got slightly better. It was 19%, so one out of five. But that's crazy. That, that's just basic bookkeeping. And so here's what we're getting to. We're getting to this example. So this is an example of a three-way reconciliation. What I've got here is I've got my bank statement. I've got any checks that are outstanding or, or uh, uncleared at month end, and I'm going to adjust that to my bank statement to get to my adjusted bank statement. And then on the right-hand side, I've got my internal reporting, my internal uh, accounting records. And so I'm listing out each of my individual clients with their balance at month end, to get to the sum of those client balances that ties into my trust ledger balance. So those are the three components. Adjusted bank balance, sum of my client balances, and then my trust ledger balance. So this is your three-way reconciliation. Now, I know we've got an audience that's um, pretty uh, spread out geographically. We're not all in one state. We're in multiple states here on the, on the call. And so uh, this requirement, it depends on your state, on whether this is a monthly or quarterly. Uh, for example, uh, folks in Florida and Arizona, Illinois, Michigan, you know, those are examples where this is a monthly requirement. 
Some other states, North Carolina is an example, uh, this is a quarterly requirement. My recommendation, whether it's monthly or quarterly for your specific state, just build this in to your process. Make sure this is a monthly process. Uh, we're going to walk through an example of this, and I'll highlight why it's so important. W what is the goal that this three-way reconciliation is trying to get to? So let's now walk through an example because I think it's really important to just see how this works in the real world. So as I see, um, I'm going to go under reconciliations. And I'm going to hit perform reconciliation. So I've already done an August reconciliation. Now I'm going to do a September 30th reconciliation. So when you do reconciliations, and I'm doing this in TrustBooks, but this is going to uh, hold true for any software program you're using. When you do reconciliations, you start with two things from your bank statement. So the two things that I'm going to start with, my date, so I'm doing a month end, September 30th, and my ending balance per the bank. So ultimately, what I'm trying to do on a reconciliation is I'm looking at my accounting records, everything that I've recorded during the month, and I'm going to match these to my bank statement. So I've got these broken out. Here are my deposits. Here are my checks and payments. I'm going to now match these to my bank statement as cleared items. So let's walk through that. So I'm going to start on the deposit side. So I've got these deposits. They all match. I was able to tie it in directly to my bank statement. Now I'm going to flip over and do the same thing on the checks and payment side. Now one thing to highlight and to point out to you before we get started Notice I've got three checks that were all dated prior to September 1st. These three checks, these were outstanding as of August 31st. And so as of August 31st, they would have shown up on my reconciliation as outstanding or unclear transactions, and they would have been adjustment to my bank balance. And so these outstanding checks, they roll forward month to month to month. And so I'm now on September 30th, and I'm working on my September 30th reconciliation, these three checks would show up when I'm doing that reconciliation to see did they actually show up on my September bank statement. All right, so now I've got my September bank statement in my hand. I'm going to look at all the detail of the checks and payments that cleared, and I'm going to start selecting them here in TrustBooks. So let's assume that these checks all cleared during the month. So the ones that I selected all clear during the month. And then I've got these four checks that at month in have yet to clear. So I'm going to keep them unchecked. These are going to be my outstanding items. So when I'm getting to my adjusted bank balance, these would be reductions to what my bank statement balance at September 30th is. And I'll show you how that looks. So I'm going to scroll down. I've got this reconciliation summary. Right now, notice I've got a difference and it's because I haven't entered that ending balance per the bank statement. Now, there's the kind of the, the art of doing a reconciliation is it's, it's black and white. And what I mean by that is it's either right or it's wrong. There is no gray. And so if I've got a difference right here, then that means that my uh, trust account is not in a properly reconciled state and I need to make some extra transactions. I need to fix that. And so right now it's not in a reconciled state because I didn't enter that ending balance per the bank statement. I don't have it comparing to anything. But we've got something where we don't allow you to fix that. We don't allow you to just force a reconciliation. And you should never force a reconciliation. This difference should always go to zero. The other uh, thing that I'll highlight is I've got the summary of my checks and payments I've got the summary of my clear deposits. If you've done this correctly, this will flow through and match your bank statement. So at the top of your bank statement, you've got a little summary section. It's going to say beginning balance. It's going to look a lot like this. It's going to say beginning balance. It's going to show you the summary of all the checks and payments and withdrawals. It's going to show you a summary of your cleared and, and processed deposits. And if you've done this correctly, if you've made all the right transactions and checked them off correctly, this will all match. So now I'm going to scroll back up, 
And, and the whole reason I'm, I'm walking you through how to do one so that I can show you the reporting that happens, what a three-way reconciliation should look like. So I'm going to hit save and reconcile. Now I'm going to log in. I'm going to look at my reconciliations. We just did the September 30th one. Here's what the three-way reconciliation is going to look like. This is what your state bar wants to see. And so I've got different components. The three components we talked about. I've got my adjusted bank balance. So I start with my bank statement balance. Again, pulling this directly off my bank statement. I've got those four checks that were outstanding, had not cleared my bank at month end. I've got my adjusted bank balance. This is going to tie in and match the sum of my client ledgers and my trust ledger. And as I scroll down, here's page two. I can see the detail of those outstanding checks. And here's the important piece. I've got a listing of all my clients with their available balance at month end. This is the third part. This is the three-way reconciliation. You want to be able to show this. In QuickBooks, you have to run some extra reports, and this is what trips people up. If you do a reconciliation in QuickBooks, yes, you're doing a reconciliation. That's great. It's a two-way reconciliation. You have to go to a different piece to pull this out. Not saying you can't do it. I'm just making you aware that it's an extra step to get here. And you've got to show this. And what this does, it's two things. One, this proves if I can show all my clients with their balance at month end, this proves that I'm maintaining client ledgers. So again, that first pitfall we talked about, this right here proves that I'm maintaining client ledgers. The other thing it does is it says, are any of these in the negative? So that's the second pitfall. So we talked about first pitfall, talked about second pitfall. This three-way reconciliation kind of ties all that together. So it says, do I have uh, client balances? So i.e. can I maintain client ledgers? Yep. And then are any of these in the negative? I can quickly scan it, see if any are in the negative. That's the purpose and the goal of this three-way reconciliation. All right. We're getting into pitfall number four. So this is good. We're, we're right on time. We're doing it all perfectly. So timing is everything. I got my man Yoda. Chad's excited. Chad's a big Star Wars fan. Um, I think it's coming out soon, but uh, timing is everything. And what does this mean? So this is on the deposit side. So as I'm making deposits into the trust account, I have to be patient. I have to wait for those funds to be available before I can make a disbursement against it. So I'm going to loop law pay into this. So let's, um, let's say we're using law pay. We've got credit card transactions. We've just uh, pulled up our law pay account. We've, we've uh, processed you know, a handful of credit card transactions today. If you were to go make an immediate disbursement against those credit card transactions, you would be violating this. Because you have to wait for those funds to be processed through LawPay. LawPay will do their batch at the end of the day. It'll take a day or two. It'll hit your bank account. Once it hits your bank account, those funds are available, and then you can make disbursements against them. And so what I mean by this is... Um, and, and why this is important is let's say uh, you've got that credit card transaction through WallPay. You've processed it today, $500. Client A gave you $500. You, you uh, processed the credit card. Um, it will take a couple days before it hits your bank account. You go and you cut a check for client A for any dollar amount. It could be $100. And you're saying, well, I just processed a credit card for $500. I can do that. Well, no. You have to wait for the funds to be available before you do it. Let's say, um, you know, bad scenario where the client uh, has an invalid credit card. Anything, you know, goes wrong on processing that credit card. Um, the client doesn't have enough funds. It's a debit card. They didn't have enough funds, so it gets rejected. Then you've made a disbursement against it, and now you've essentially taken money from a different client to use on behalf of client A. I've talked about law pay and, and using credit cards. It's the same, same concept holds true if you've got a paper check that you've received and you're filling out a deposit slip and you take that deposit slip to the bank. You've deposited it. You go in and you make an immediate disbursement. What if that check bounces? What if it you know, works its way through the banking system? That check bounces. You've made an immediate disbursement against it. 
now again you've taken funds from a different client to use on behalf of client A. Essentially what it's doing is that client A, their client ledger is going into the negative. So again, these all you see how that all feeds into each other, it all builds on each other. So you don't want to bring a client ledger into the negative. So therefore, you can't have immediate disbursements against deposits. You have to wait for those funds to be available. Final, final uh, talking point, final pitfall, the month in reporting. So this is important, and this is also uh, one of those areas where it trips a lot of attorneys, a lot of small law firms up. They just don't know what to look at. I've had it a lot of times where... Um, there's confusion on what reporting to look at, what does the state bar require, what's good just from an internal process and best practice uh, standpoint. And so we'll go through, I've got four here. This is not an all-inclusive list, but these are the four reports that um, a couple are requirements. So like the three-way reconciliation, we already talked about that. I won't highlight that again, but we already talked about it. I'll show you the detailed reconciliation that's doing your month end reconciliation um, or kind of the basic reconciliation at a high level. It's tying your bank statement into your trust ledger. That's what, if you're doing a reconciliation in QuickBooks, that's, your, uh, that's getting to your detailed reconciliation. I'll talk about number three, the client activity report. Uh, this is not a requirement, but it's a best practice. Uh, we found that that attorneys and law firms, they love being able to look at this report. It's just laser focused on giving them the right information. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about the trust ledger report. So I'm gonna actually highlight these. Um, I wanna show you what these look like. So I'm gonna go back in, look at our month end reports. And so the three-way reconciliation, that's the one that I'm starting with. Um, we've already looked at that, that's a requirement. We've already spent some time, so I won't show you that again. The detailed reconciliation report, this one's going to be helpful because essentially it's tying all those transactions that we checked off and matched to our bank statement. It's going to give you that detail. So I've got my beginning balance. That should match your beginning balance per the bank statement. I've got clear transactions. I've got clear deposits, clear payments. These are going to tie into your bank statement. So if you look at this report, you should be able to tie this in and follow it along with your bank statement. I've got cleared balance. That clear balance should match your bank statement balance. So that's going to be a 100% a match to your bank statement balance. As I got page two, I've got the uh, reconciling items. So I've got those four checks that were uncleared. That gives me back to my ending balance, my adjusted ending balance um, that ties into my trust ledger balance. So this is high level. The trust ledger report, this is at a high level just showing all activity in and out of your trust account. Now, your state bar is going to require that you've got some sort of ledger. Uh, I've seen it where this is, uh, the terminology on this can go in a lot of different, um, different ways. I call it a trust ledger. Uh, some states call it a statement of costs and receipts. Some states call this a check register. So those are all synonymous. And what you've got here is you've got just high level, all the activity. Um, you can see the client, but it's not segregated out on a, on a client ledger yet. This is just high level, all activity in and out of your trust account. And then the final report that I'll show you is this client activity report. Again, this is not a requirement that I've seen, but it's a really helpful report. And so if you can, highly encourage being able to pull this sort of report. Um, one of the things, this report automatically happens in TrustBooks, so it's, it's real easy to just have right at my fingertips. And what it does is I've got clients, so all of my clients, I've got their beginning balance for the month. It shows me all the monthly activity and then their ending balance for the month. So the reason why I like this report so much is on a single report, I can literally go client by client, get a nice snapshot where they were at the beginning of the month, <clears throat> monthly activity, and then their balance at the end of the month. Um, it, it will allow me to see red flags, highlight anything that just 
from a, a gut perspective doesn't feel good. Um, it doesn't necessarily allow me to take action, but this will be the highlight, the first step to say, all right, does this give me the warm and fuzzies that my trust account is um, maintained and accurate and complete? All right, so we've talked about the five uh, pitfalls. We're kind of going into the, the final phase of today's webinar, um, action items. So I want to walk through each of these. Um, I want you to be able to you know, leave this webinar with taking some real action for your trust account and making sure you're not falling victim to these pitfalls. So review these. You know, look yourself in the mirror. Are you guilty of any of these? If you are, you know, take steps now. Take action. The second one, um, keep it simple. I, I'm always, uh, I'm an accountant, I'm a CPA, but I'm, I, I hate complexity. And I think in the trust accounting world, things have gotten too complex. And, and there's books, literally books written on how to manipulate you know, things to work for your trust account. And when you have to write a book on how to use a software for something it's not intended for, that's when it gets too complex. Or if you've developed these internal systems and processes that are pages and pages and pages long, then it's gotten too complicated. So think about this scenario. If someone in your firm left, could someone new quickly take over the trust accounting duties with relative ease? A another way to think about this is, would your firm skip a beat? Hopefully not. And if it, if it does, then reassess your trust accounting process. Make sure it's simple and repeatable. And then technology. Um, you know, I'm biased. The law pay folks, we're all biased here. We're big fans of technology. Um, and there's this new thing going on around in the legal profession. This uh, States are adopting this duty of technology competence. Now, it's, it's a nice sound bite. What it means in the real world, I, I don't know that there's a lot of meat behind it, but it's a good sound bite, and it's where the profession is moving. Per uh, Bob Ambrosi, if anybody follows Bob Ambrosi, uh, he does a great blog. I encourage you to look at it. Um, he's counted it, and up to 28 states have, a do, have uh, adopted this duty of technology. You know, our perspective, my perspective is use technology. The trust accounting side does not have to be complex. Um, if you don't use technology, then it is complex, and you do leave yourself susceptible to risk, and it doesn't have to be that way. And then final, um, no longer is ignorance an excuse. Uh, you're an attorney, you're managing the trust account. The public bestows a tremendous amount of trust in the legal profession to manage these funds that you're holding in this fiduciary role. And so just know that you're on the hook. And it kind of goes back to that first slide. That first slide that said the number one way to get this bar, mismanagement of the trust account. My experience, I've seen states are cracking down they're making the rules tougher. Um, they are not lenient on trust accounting violations. So take it upon yourself to really be a step ahead of the game. All right. So uh, I've got my man Arnold there. Go out, conquer trust accounting. So uh, just want to leave with that. So we're going to transition to q and I know that Chad's got some Q&A lined up. And before we do, uh, I know that uh, Amy and Amanda talked a little bit on just the, the integration and the partnership that we've got between TrustBooks and WallPay. I wanted to take a second and from our perspective, just talk about how this is such a, a perfect one-two solution and then we'll get in to the Q&A side. So we see the WallPay TrustBooks um, kind of fit being, you need to go get money into your trust account, great. Use WallPay. Now you need to go account for that money, perfect. Use trust books. So we've got this really perfect complement to each other. Um, and then within the integration piece, we're able to pull in all that uh, credit card activity that you've got through LawPay directly into your trust books account. So it just makes it so easy and simple to record it in trust books, assign it to the right client, and you're done. I mean, literally that simple, you're done. Um, it's been just a really smooth um, and perfect integration with the LawPay team. So, um, and then, 
one more note on TrustBooks. Um, we love our users. We get great feedback from our users. We're really proud of it. Uh, Abigail, she was one of our very first users. It's pretty cool. She's got a very kind of uh, powerful, emotional type testimonial um, that she gave us. We don't get that too often in the trust accounting software space. So it's pretty neat that uh, it kind of uh, prompted her to have a very passionate type uh, response to her use of TrustBooks. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chad and uh, let's open it up for some Q&A. Hey, thanks, Tom. Lot, lots of great stuff there. Thanks for running through that. Um, we did have a couple of questions. These are the easy ones. I'm just going to go ahead and answer. Um, I've been responding to everybody individually. Uh, Paul had a question, does TrustBooks sync with Clio? Um, uh, Eduardo had the similar question. Uh, yes, we do. We synchronize with Clio. So we'll pull all your matter and client information into TrustBooks. And then as you create um, as you create uh, activities uh, and transactions inside of TrustBooks, we can synchronize that back to Clio for you. So you only have to put it in. Um, one, uh, Eduardo also asked, do we have plans to produce a public API? Uh, not currently at this time. Currently, we've picked two big partners that we want to work with, uh, the two that we think are best in class, and that's LawPay and Clio. So for short-term future, uh, that's, that's, that's where we're going to be headed. Um, and then there was also a question about, will this webinar be available for later? We are recording it. And we'd be glad to provide a link to everybody that's on the webinar so that you guys could go back and, um, and look through it. Um, so those are kind of the technical questions. And then a couple of uh, more detailed questions around the actual content. Um, you had kind of went through some of the month-end reports, Tom, and you kind of put them all there. Uh, good stuff, but if, if, if I'm an attorney and I'm trying to just start something, like right now I, I've got someone else who's, who's doing my trust accounting for me, I want better insight. Where's the best place to start? Give me like, you know, uh, uh, one thing that I should do and then the frequency that I should do it kind of as my next step. Yeah, perfect. Um, good good question. Um, so if I'm solo, small law firm, I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around the reporting side, which is key. It's key to have that real kind of in-depth and, and understanding over what reports do I want to look at each month. Uh, it gives you great insight into what's going on, uh, you've got that comfort level, that peace of mind, um, the, yeah, as I refer to the ability to sleep at night. And so a couple different things to hit on there. Um, some of them were in that requirements. I'll just kind of do a quick snapshot on um, the ones that uh, I think are the most important. And also they kind of tie into some of these requirements also. But we've got it right here where at month end we generate these uh, trust account reports. We do this automatically for you and then we pull in the reconciliation reports. The reason why we do this is we know that it can be overwhelming. We know that what should I look at at month end can be a real challenge. So we didn't want our users to overthink, all right, what should I specifically be looking at? And so in my perspective, I would go right here. I would say, all right, I need to look at the trust ledger report. Why do I need to do that? And what is this? This is a single report that shows all my activity for the month, high level, in and out. So I can scan it. I can say, yep, this transaction makes sense, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. It's a quick scan just to make sure at, in one spot you're tracking all the activity in and out. Uh, the payments report, this is going to be helpful if I just want a really condensed summary saying, here's everything that left my account for the month. Okay, great. I've got it right here in a, a report. It shows everything that left my account. So I can scan it. I can do a, a quick audit too. I can look at my bank statement. I can see what I've recorded in my internal accounting system. So, so for example, TrustBooks in this example. Um, and then I can look at my bank statement and maybe look at a sample of clear checks. And this is going to maybe uncover any fraud or embezzlement. Um, if you've got multiple people touching the trust account, this is going to be really helpful. Does what I'm showing in my internal accounting records match the actual check? And then I can scan the actual check. I can look at the endorsement line, at the signature line, at the payee line. You know, it doesn't have to be real in-depth. It can be a quick scan to make sure there's no potential risk of fraud or embezzlement. Um, I'll kind of go into the next one, the deposits report. This one's going to be helpful. Uh, you want to be able to pull a report together, and I'll show you what this looks like. So for September, I've got Terry Bradshaw here. 
I'm looking at my bank statement. The reason why this is important is when you look at your bank statement, you'll see one deposit for $2,000. It's a lump sum deposit. And so as I'm doing a review at month end, I'm going to want to take that a step further. Okay, that's great. I can tie $2,000 in from trust books to my bank statement, but now I want to take it a step further and really understand what are the actual transactions around that $2,000. And so if you've got a deposit summary that breaks out each individual deposit with the detail, this is really helpful, again, to do a quick scan to see what's make, what makes up each one of those deposits. And then the, the final ones, the client activity report, I've already shown you that. To, to me, that's my favorite. To me, that's the one that I go to first because, again, I've got a single report, client by client, beginning balance, monthly activity, ending balance. I can use that and within probably two minutes, really get my arms around what happened on a client by client basis and whether that makes sense. And then of course, uh, wrapping it up with the two reconciliation reports, um, these are the requirements. These are the mandates that you do the three way and the detail. Okay, so, thank you, Tom. Sorry, um, I got a little, little long winded there, but uh, good stuff. Okay, good. Um, so uh, that's kind of stems some reporting questions. Um, is there a filter in trust books that filters out clients who have a balance? Um, or that's not been utilized, incoming or outgoings for a year, and is there any type of a five-year filter so you can go back for historic purposes? Yeah, good question. So um, a couple things on that front. If I go to the dashboard and I'm going to look at my matter list, so we've got the ability, so here are all my matters, and here's the available balance. So if I wanted to, if any of these go to a zero balance, and I don't have any with a zero balance yet, but at any times I can archive them. So this really helps you kind of clean up so that I'm only looking at the clients that have activity, that have a balance. And then if I want to, I can hit the print active matters. That's just going to give me a snapshot of my matter list with their available balance. So at any time, I can hit this print active matters and give me a report that shows me, all right, on a client by client basis, what funds do they have in the trust account? And then if I want to do any extra reporting, I can go under reports and hit build custom reports. And this is where you've got a lot of flexibility. So if you wanted to do additional reporting, you've got a lot of different filters here. You could filter it out, hit update, and print it to a PDF or export it to a CSV file. Okay, yeah, great stuff. And then um, uh, two other questions. Um, first one is, could you just quickly repeat the steps on the three-way, and, and maybe this time um, you can show the report, maybe I think in TrustBooks, which would help, but just kind of walk them through if they're not a TrustBooks customer, how do they pull this data together? Just That's one of the real core items. How do we give them a great takeaway on the three-way? Yeah, so on the three-way, um, so the two kind of most common are going to be QuickBooks or Excel. So I'll, I'll talk on each one of those. In QuickBooks, uh, most people, if you're using QuickBooks, you kind of understand the reconciliation process and so you know that you go into QuickBooks, you do a reconciliation. I talked about that being more of this two-way reconciliation uh, and what I mean by that is you're reconciling the bank statement to the trust ledger high level. But within QuickBooks, um, really to get down to a client level, hopefully you've set it up and this is where it gets challenging and, and this is where it gets complex. Hopefully you've gone into the chart of accounts. For each client, you've created a sub-liability account. And so each client gets a sub-liability account. It shows up on your balance sheet. If you've got a lot of clients, it can get lengthy, but that's how you would um, kind of hopefully force into recording transactions on a client-by-client -client basis by chart of accounts, sub-liability, and then having, um, when you go to uh, cut a check, to re record it to the right sub liability account that, that matches the client. And then, so at month end, when you go to do a reconciliation, you're doing this standard two-way reconciliation. Then you go in and you go under the reporting side and you have to pull out a separate report that would show um, basically a balance sheet breakout. It would pull out all of your sub liability accounts and you would piece those three together, those three components. The, the reconciliation showing the two-way trust ledger bank statement, and then the third report that would be uh, 
a report that you pull out of QuickBooks that would show all your sub liability accounts on a client by client basis and, and hopefully those all match. So that's okay. QuickBooks. Excel, um, it, it's, it's really that same concept. You're going to maintain a trust ledger. So in Excel, and I've done this before, this, this is how I started. So this is, this is how I know it so well. I used to be in, in doing this. I used to do QuickBooks. I used to do Excel for all my clients when I had um, Boyle CPA. And so in Excel, we would maintain one tab that was the ledger. So high level, all activity, in and out. So we would reconcile to that one tab. Then we would maintain separate tabs for each individual client. So each individual client would get a separate tab. Now, that can get pretty, pretty big. Um, and I remember I've, I had one client. We had an Excel file. They had over 150 tabs because they had that many clients in and out of their trust account. And so you've got to have this reconciliation now that will pull together all those different components. And so you've got to have you know, this, this equation, basically, on a summary tab that will give you a reconciliation and then pull in each of your clients with their balance at month end from each of the individual tabs. So those are the, the, the ways to do it in QuickBooks and Excel. Okay. And Tom, if it's okay, I'm just going to take a second and I'm, I'm going to layer on a, a, a very simple answer um, for some of you that, that might be looking for something <laughs> a higher level. Is You basically have to take your bank statement and you have to balance it to your internal records for your trust. So if your internal records are in TrustBooks, QuickBooks, Zero, whatever it is, you have to balance your bank to your general records. That's a two-way reconciliation. The third piece is wherever you keep all your client balances, you have to run the appropriate report and add all those together. Those three dollar amounts have to match. If you're using Excel or QuickBooks, it's a little tough because they're not built to hold all that information, so you kind of have to piece it together. If you're using TrustBooks, we automatically build that report for you, but the real takeaway is you can't just balance your bank to your books. You have to balance your banks to your books to your client ledgers. Is that accurate, Tom? That's accurate. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, and then this will kind of be our closing question. We've got just a minute or two here. Um, uh, Eduardo, by the way, thank you for all the great questions. Um, Brandy asked a question that um, th are there any new rules um, that or anything that you know that you've seen that auditors are looking for um, outside of just the basic accounting and reporting, such as dollars sitting in an account for a certain amount of time or expired transactions on the books? Any takeaways you've seen as we've been doing consulting with clients and helping them dig into their accounts? And uh, brief here, we can follow up more with Brandy sure. one but just sure. last minute, any, any high-level takeaways? Yeah, I, I'm hesitant to get too much into the details on this one because this could be more of a state-by-state state specific. Um, but at a high level, I've seen where uh, state bars don't like to just see funds sitting, sitting dormant for year after year. So, for example, if there are funds that uh, you have in your trust account and they are your client funds, and you've tried to research and, and find that client, um, or you haven't. It, it really comes into play when you haven't. Uh, they don't like to just have it sit there if it's not money that you anticipate doing something with. If it ultimately just needs to be returned to the client, um, they encourage you to take pretty you know, proactive action in finding that client and being able to disperse the funds to that client. Uh, if not, there's usually an sheeting process that gets involved but a sheeting is kind of that last step. So it's just, um, that, that's kind of a, a general uh, overview that I've seen. Okay, um, and guys, I would add, if you have any questions, you can send them directly to Tom at trustbooks.com. So any questions based on the webinar, um, any positive feedback, you can send to chat at trustbooks.com. Any complaints, you can send to Tom <laughs> at trustbooks.com um, for sure. Um, and with that, Let's, let's kind of maybe just turn it back over um, to our law pay folks and just see if there's anything they want to add at the end. But I think we'll, we'll use this as a way to kind of close up and thank everybody for attending. Yeah, no, I think that's us for, that's it for us too. Um, I just want to thank you guys again for, um, you know, putting together all of this great content and for 
um, everybody who's on the call for joining us today. We're always here if you have any questions. Um, like Chad said, you can reach out to Tom. His email address is right there. And so um, let us know how we can help support your firm. Let us know how we can help you. And uh, and we're looking forward to a lot more um, opportunities to collaborate with Trust Books. And we'll be sure to let you know about any future events or webinars or um, things that we're doing to try to help equip you guys for success. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Everyone have a great day.